Hi, my name is Katrona Blompier, and I'm the founder of a company called Procure Worldwide. We specialize in making valuable connections between brands and individuals, whether they be high profile actors, musicians, presenters, or activists and experts. It's really the rationale and authenticity behind making that connection that's all important. And it's purpose that's the impetus that drives us on to take part in projects and campaigns that garner real results. Within our company and within my personal career, we've conducted many large scale endorsement and partnership deals with high profile individuals on behalf of brands for use in all forms of advertising and marketing. Mr. Warburton, Robert De Niro's waiting. No, I'm not. Jonathan, what do you call this? Bolton Bakes Best Bagel? My butt. Well, as far back as I can remember, I always wanted to bake bagel. I'm not done. Me and my New York associates, we've been thinking, who's this skinny kid muscling in on the bagel business? Skinny, that's all. I'm still not done. You got a nice family business here, Johnny boy. Very nice. And it's given me an idea. Picture this. Some of these campaigns have become well known and have been referred to in press or industry papers. And more recently, in order to debate a really important and relevant topic. What is influence in today's world? Who should brands and entities seek to endorse them and personify them in this current climate? How can brands partner with people of influence and who should they choose? Are the lines about what is influence, especially on digital platforms with so much currency and power changing? At Procure, this led us to further develop a wing of our company with purpose placed firmly at its core. Some of the recent work we've been so proud to be part of specifically seeks to harness influence for the greater good. And that is what we're here to talk about today. I'd like to introduce you to Kathleen Wilkinson, who is head of strategy at Procure Worldwide and is intrinsically involved with this kind of work for our company. And I also would like to introduce you to Lizzie Carr, founder of Plastic Patrol, a person of influence that we've been so fortunate to work with over the last years on behalf of clients to help them to educate, inform and highlight vitally important issues to their consumers and to their customers, such as in this case, the use of plastics, recycling, the circular economy, data collection, the power to inform policy and how we, the consumers and brands can get involved. Thanks, Katrina. Uh, my name is Kathleen and I joined Procure Worldwide three years ago um, to launch the digital side of our talent offering. And at the time, endorsement from digital first talent, otherwise known as influencers, uh, was an important part of brand strategies, um, whether they were using A-list talent or not, um, and tended to be quite straightforward with a lot of product placement style content taking place. I think now our department of the company really tends to focus on people of influence. Um, it's not solely about online reach, uh, we're talking about offline here too. Uh, really considering what sphere of influence do these people have that could be relevant to the brand, i.e., you know, in industry, in policy, in the community, um, in activism, and so on. So we really focus on identifying the purpose-driven or interesting points of difference uh, for each brief. It will not only cut through on social, uh, but it will also unlock the door to engage the right kind of influencer, whether that is an expert, an activist, or a creator for the brand to collaborate with. And this is how we met Lizzie a few years ago when working on a sustainability campaign for a client, uh, where we secured her as a speaker uh, for a panel talk. Um, we have since continued to cultivate a long-term relationship uh, between Lizzie and that specific client, um, which has resulted in a more and more integrated style of partnership with her each year. Uh, the key approach here has been about working closely with the client to redefine what an influencer really means to them. Um, and Lizzie's role is now much more like a consultant for the brand internally. Uh, as well as externally. So I'm now going to hand over to Lizzie to introduce herself. 
Hello, so I'm Lizzie Carr. I'm a campaigner, adventurer and founder of a global movement called Plastic Patrol, um, which I'm sure we'll come on to a little bit more to detail. I think what will be interesting by the end of dis this discussion is to establish whether or not I am an influencer. What does that word actually mean? How do, how do I sit in that spectrum of, of the world of influence? Lizzie, do you want to explain a little bit more about what Plastic Patrol is and kind of how it all began and what the story is? Yeah, so Plastic Patrol now is a global movement that sits at the intersection of well-being and environment and that effectively means that we uh, take people out on activity-based cleanups all over the world whether that's paddleboarding, yoga, parkour, hip fitness, all completely free and in return their payment, their nature tax is that they log litter in the Plastic Patrol app and then we use that to work with scientists and partners to understand sort of trends and patterns um, around litter pollution all over the world. My journey to get to where Plastic Patrol is now has been um, I suppose I certainly didn't expect my life to go in that direction. So about six years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer and I took up paddle boarding really as a low impact way to recover. It was just a great way for me to get fit and sort of regain my strength again. And it was only because I was paddle boarding that I was able to see what the problem with plastic looked like firsthand on the water. And probably like a lot of other people up until that point, I was very much in an environmental sleepwalk. I was just living in my own bubble within my own existence, not really thinking about the world around me. Um, but paddleboarding really changed that and really, I suppose, opened my eyes, magnified this problem to me. And since then I'd sort of dedicated myself to, to campaigning, to activism around this really important issue, trying to get people to understand how big this problem really is so I took on, I quit my job in 2015 and then took on my first big endurance challenge in 2016 where I paddleboarded the length of England and I photographed and plotted every single piece of plastic that I encountered on that journey. And it was sort of in this interactive map which later became the Plastic Patrol app. Um, and from there, I mean, Plastic Patrol just started as a hashtag during that, during that expedition. And from there, it's obviously evolved and evolved now and this sort of groundswell of support from people all over the world that have wanted to take action and wanted to support it, have kind of come forward and got involved with the movement. And um, so that in a nutshell is sort of where Plastic Patrol started and, and what it's become at this point. And coming to this point now then, today, would you say you are an influencer? Um, it's a very debated word. Um, so would you describe yourself as one, do you think? Personally, I don't describe myself in that way. I don't see myself as an influencer. I didn't set out to be an influencer in the kind of typical sense of the word. I took on challenges and set up Plastic Patrol to create positive influence, mm. but it's such a small part of all the work I do. I think I see it more as I share resources, I share knowledge, I educate and I create a platform that people can take action and that's that's my kind of my role and the influence that I have, the social media channels that I use, that's a tool, that's not the job, it's just a channel to communicate the work that I do. Yeah, yeah and on that topic kind of in your opinion what do you think influence it is, what do you think influence is then in today's world um do you think it is more around uh, the use of um social platforms as new media channels um and do you think they're being used in the right way it's a good question i think influence it's a big word right and you yeah. can you can influence yeah. people on traditional <laughs> you can influence people in traditional media so through news tv radio that kind of thing i think where that falls short now falls short now and social media sort of steps in is that traditional media it's almost got quite lazy and it's not very critical and it doesn't really delve deeper into issues it's very much um regurgitating press releases that have come from brands or from government but they're not investigating anything whereas i think on social media influencers historically 
has been quite one dimensional. Whereas now influencers are taking this information and they are dismantling it and they are questioning it and they're using their platforms to really educate and inform people about hugely important topics. So I almost think they've taken over the role of traditional media. And mm. by doing that, they've created this really powerful sense of trust from their audience and credibility yeah. from their audience. And I think that means a lot of people are now shifting away from traditional news outlets and focusing their time they would spend reading the news, actually just going to trusted sources within their digital channels to get information and help shape their views and inform their thinking. Yeah, yeah. sure. And I think that is the really positive side of things. I guess you could argue that on the flip side, um, it can also be quite dangerous because you can have um, people with massive influence who are encouraging their audience to buy into or to follow certain trends or um, products that are dangerous. But because they've got so much influence, um, it's really working and um, maybe more than a kind of traditional billboard ad might have. So and that, yeah, that's where it gets quite worrying, I think, because yeah. it's not even like promoting sort of necessarily like bad, bad products, but also fake news and misinformation. And I've, I've noticed more, and I think this is a really positive thing, uh, influencers or storytellers or educators citing sources of information. And I think that is absolutely critical as we kind of move forward in this space. We have to understand that information is coming from rep reputable, trusted sources, and it's not just opinion based. And I think that is what helps build credibility within that space. Yeah. Well, it's been yeah. quite prevalent during this pandemic, hasn't it? I mean, you've seen a huge amount of quite scary sort of influence coming out from people that are not medically trained or anything like that. So that's been quite mm. an interesting one to watch as well. Um, mm. I mean, Lizzie, do you think that you know people? who of influence really can now actually change the course of policy. I mean, you know, it seems to me that something that you're knocking the door of hugely. So is this something that's possible? Can you influence huge global conglomerates? Can you ultimately change policy? How much power have you really got? I think the sort of influencer slash activist world, I think their two words are very closely linked now have like, huge amounts of power in that space when it's kind of harnessed in the right way to be able to create a grassroots movement and a groundswell within that is incredibly powerful look at fridays for future with greta look at more recently the black lives matter movement that's yeah. all come from sort of single events that have sparked this like wildfire of um of activism, of campaigning from people that are sort of standing up for injustices in the world. And I think it's just, government has to respond to that. They have to react, brands have to react to that. Yeah. And- It's ground up, isn't if it? we it's weren't, ground up stuff, this. Definitely, and if we weren't in the world that we exist in today with social media, with digital channels, there's so many people that wouldn't have the privilege of their voices being amplified or a platform to share their experiences the way they do now. I look back at Plastic Patrol where it started, me on a paddleboard on England's canals. No one really cared what I was doing. I was banging my head against the brick wall with, you know, trying to mm. communicate all these issues about plastic pollution and use adventure as a way to tell this really important environmental story. But now four years on, that has completely changed. It's kind of just done a complete 180. So it's amazing. It's amazing how much, you know, you could actually be able to go and knock on the door of number 10 from having started at a, um, you know, paddle boarding around the waterways and actually just now being able to, to collect data, which we'll go on to later, that, in, that, that informs them, data they haven't got, that you're able to be able to actually provide them. I think the key thing, the key thing with that is that's not me going out and doing that. That's a whole movement of people all over the world. And we've got people from 85 countries now that are actively participating in crowdsourcing data that's come from one person who started mm. unintentionally almost this, this sort of global movement. Like I'm living, living proof of the fact that you can, with one voice and one person, use social media in a really positive way and yeah, yeah spark a social change a social movement but then use data and information from that movement to then inform yeah. 
what's happening at government level, what's happening at industry level, use that to help provide solutions. Like you say, the data that we collect and the way that we collect it, they don't have access to this in any other way. Mm. It's, it's kind of very unique what we do. And it means it's valuable. It's your power. Yeah. But it then means that we can enter those conversations. We're taken seriously. You know, we're not just out there litter picking and like effectively cleaning up the rubbish. We're able to like cut through into really important conversations at the top mm. and help help shape what the system change will look like. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and you're actually partnering with brands that you know are plastic brands or whatever you know in order to be able to work with people, work with the brand in order to be able to you know in help to create solutions. Um, and have you seen you know how your interest from brands has changed year to year? I mean. It must be increasing and you know you must be able to garner more kind of um sort of power from from your relationship with brands in this way do you know the, the what has been really interesting with brands is three or four years ago when plastic patrol was in its sort of early days you wouldn't you wouldn't see any brands approaching you to to work um in uh, internally on their um staff engagement There'd be a few brands that would approach us to do more like uh, consumer activated campaigns. But now what we're seeing really interestingly is this consideration for their internal sustainability culture and mm. their siphoning money that would be used on team building days or staff nights out and putting them into really meaningful experiences like corporate cleanups mm. on plastic patrol, you know, going out for a day on a paddleboard with the staff. It is team building, but they're getting a lot more from it than just kind of going mm. out and doing one of those often quite cringy experiences. Um, yeah. This has been quite a recent transition, but in the last 18 months, I would say the growth of those inquiries has been absolutely astronomical at Plastic Patrol, where we've seen these brands suddenly think, hang on, this isn't just about the consumer, this is about what's happening internally, how Us. staff are, mm. are dealing with this mm. kind of these environmental issues, how they feel about this stuff. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's definitely one area of it that I've seen a big, a big change. And it's from the inside out, right? So that's great that that is being recognised. And you know, staff need to be educated on these topics to then be able to activate and execute, um, whether it's campaigns in a marketing team or whether it's, you know, legal and finance, it, it's all a holistic picture and everybody needs to be super educated. I think so, because when we've worked with brands that have partnered with us to do internal work, sit on panels, staff clean up days, and be really sort of ingrained and involved in their, their comm strategy around sustainability, but then also have worked with them on doing public facing sustainability campaigns. The fact that the whole company gets it, the whole brand understands what we're trying to achieve, what our objective is, you can see there's a marked difference between you know how much we get from it and how much they get from it when they fully invest in sort of the work that we're doing and it's not just a tick box exercise. Mm. I mean, presumably, it's also incredibly powerful. I mean, you know, those people are within the brands and they are seeing firsthand what you're doing and then they're being able to change how they as a brand work, um, you know, or they as a brand, what they, their corporate policies are or, you know, how they react to sustainability, how, you know, sustainable they are. So those are the people that, 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 that matter, really, in order to be able to change things from the inside out, don't, aren't they, Lizzie? I mean, you, you're, you're speaking to them when you're up on a paddleboard, and that's quite an informal but powerful mm. way of being able to, to actually engage authentically with brands in that way. I think so. And I suppose when you look at the question, what is influence? Of course, you can be an influencer on your social channels, but if it stops there, and you can't then back that up with conversations with industry and with brands, mm. how much influence are you really having? Yeah. And I mean, how much do you think you you have personally? I mean, tell us a bit about where you felt powerful. I mean, don't be shy to tell us where you felt that you had a good <laughs> moment um, in terms of actually you felt, gosh, you know, this is the culmination of everything I've wanted for Plastic Patrol. I feel like I'm really making a wave here. T tell us about something that, that has really sort of you felt you felt great about it in, in the in the last few months. Gosh, that's a really big question. I, I suppose like there's no doubt that I have a social following personally and through Plastic Patrol. 
but like I said earlier, that is a really small part of it. And then obviously there's this kind of power that you have an influence that you have with people that are actively joining your cleanups and participating on them and the ability to speak directly with them face to face and have this like dialogue that you wouldn't get through social media so it brings this sort of digital world to life these people that follow you on social yeah. media are coming and being part of what you're doing in real life yeah. and there's a lot of power to that um and them experiencing it and seeing you out there getting your hands dirty i'm not just telling you what to do and what this problem is i'm i'm actually actively trying to tackle it myself and i think all of that then builds up to make you i suppose more interesting to brands and more valuable to them in a way as well because you're literally the mouth the spokesperson the mouthpiece for the the your yeah. followers the people that are almost like you're representing them you're speaking on their behalf mm. they follow you because they care about what you care about so when i'm talking to big brands and even when I have meetings at policy level with, with government, you know, you, you understand that because we're collecting data, because what we do is so unique, like it's just not, you're not able to replicate that unless you have the support of the general public and them actively taking action to do something about it. We, they, they can't have information that we provide them. So it's almost like if you want to work with us and benefit from what we can give you, then you have to align with that with our sort of approach and our ethos rather than the expectation being that we have to adjust our messaging and who we are to to fit in with brands and i think that's mm. where i felt that plastic patrol increasingly has had more power because almost you know we we can we call the shots effectively yeah you know what what are you what what sort of difference are you making in terms of policy can you tell us a little bit about that from a government point of view so every year we release an impact report with all of the data that we collect broken down by types of litter brands of litter um geographical location then sort of more interesting patterns that we identify within that and then that gets given to government to review and also to, to big to big brands that are a big part of the problem um, to review as well. So there's been ongoing dialogue with DEFRA and um, you may or may not know about the um, the litter strategy that was put in place in 2017 and some of the actions that need to be um, committed to within that. But then there's also the extended producer responsibility reform um, and that is going to, when that goes ahead, create significant changes with how the tax system works and how industry and manufacturers are held accountable. So all of the data that we collect can be used very tangibly to feed into sort of both of those areas specifically. And I also heard about a campaign that you're kind of, you know, directly involved with about human rights and um, and rivers and, and you know, waterways. Can you, can you tell me a bit more about that? Because that sounds so powerful. Yeah, I mean, we're not just looking at plastic pollution my campaigning and my activism work is around waterways rivers and canals specifically that's where you know my passion definitely sits and we've had events in the past where we've had to to cancel or postpone them because it's it's been cited because uh, water levels have been too high because of excess rainfall and flooding but the reality is that the water the water is too toxic for people to paddleboard on or swim in because of sewage overflow and there's been recent stuff out in the press recently about um the impact of uh, agri agri the impact of agricultural runoff on our rivers and what that means long term for human health as well so there's this huge problem with our rivers and our toxicity levels in those rivers that isn't getting the public or media attention that is required and there's other countries right. in around the world that have created this blueprint for um for human rights of their rivers uh, New Zealand, India, they both done it um, so that they can offer better protections to them and make them safer places for people to enjoy. So the mm. idea is that we will create that same law in this country. We will give our rivers in this country human rights. We can act as custodians for those rivers and make sure that corporations that are allowed to effectively just spill out raw sewage into our waterways or allow agricultural runoff to enter our waterways because councils haven't considered that as part of planning, 
that has mm. to stop under new legislation and guidelines. So it's, it's a massive ask and it's a massive legislatory change. But, you know, we're about to come out of the EU. We're going to have to look at all of this stuff anyway. We need to make sure we uphold or at least it, in, at the very least uphold, ideally improve on the standards that already exist. So if there was ever a time to be looking at this, it's now. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Lizzie, did you ever see yourself um, getting to this position and kind of leading these conversations? Honestly, no, because like I said earlier, I was in a sleepwalk. I wasn't an environmentalist. I wasn't a campaigner. I didn't study sciences in any form. This is, I wouldn't say it's a new world to me now, but it was. But I think when you're so angry, you are, that's where passion comes from. I think you have to get angry to then get the drive to act. Yeah. And I think I've just been, I've been cross for a long time about this kind of stuff. <laughs> Quite rightly so, I think. Yeah. Um, okay, well, if we talk about, I guess, the future um where do you see i mean it's a well debated conversation but where do you see the future of the influencer industry heading and do you think that you're perhaps almost um above the curve a little bit uh, in in that um trajectory It's, an, it's a really interesting question. I think where I'd like to see it going is that brands and creators work together and cultivate more meaningful, deeper relationships. And that means brands putting more, influ uh, that means brands putting more emphasis on how influencers can help shape strategy and be part of that rather than being used as just a promotional tool. So yeah. I think as a campaigner and activist... They're having a real role, you mean? Yeah. I think I'm really often perceived by some brands um, as the enemy because I, I call myself a campaigner. I'm known to be an activist. But I do a lot of work, as you know, because I work with you guys in sustainability comms and consulting. And... I think there's so much to be said for using influencers that do have knowledge and experience in certain sectors to bring those into internal communications, bring that external voice in and help that aid discussion and don't be afraid of that. So, yeah, I think brands have to understand that there's so much more that, that influencers, and I say that word loosely, can offer them. Yeah. I get approached by brands often who've obviously looked through my social media, seen that I talk about sustainability and well-being and ask me to then, you know, promote a particular product. And I'll look at the brand and think, gosh, there's so much more that we could do here. Like this is really exciting. We could create something really powerful and really meaningful, but they have no idea about any of the other work that I do. And sometimes I find that quite frustrating because you know that this brand that want to work with you could really, really benefit from just having a discussion and mm. thinking a bit more about collaborating. But often mm. it's just, we need to promote this product and it's still the case, we need to promote this product, how can you help us do that? And I think that's where it is changing and it still needs to change. And what would you say to people who are sitting in brand teams who maybe would look at the work that you do um, or your kind of experience or maybe someone who is at a similar level in um, kind of campaigning for a different issue um, what would you say to people who are sat in brands who maybe think or oh, are you slightly out of reach for us um, you know or maybe a bit nervous about kind of coming together with you because they're nervous about what they uh, might have to reveal or kind of ex they might feel a bit exposed by talking to you kind of what, what would you say to brands who yeah are feeling a bit nervous about working with activists yeah i think that's a great question because there must be a lot of nervousness from brands out there just expecting to be called out i can't speak yeah. for everybody but for me 
personally it's not about calling anybody out it's about finding solutions and you have to work across industry across government across the general public to really find those solutions at the moment there's a, a, a lot of finger pointing and there's a real blame culture out there and that just means progress is stalled and we're not yeah. reaching the end point and the end goal we want to get to so i would say to brands and people within brands if you believe in the roadmap you've created and it's tangible and there's commitments that you can reach and you're happy to talk about those then have a conversation with somebody like me or you guys who can facilitate those kind of conversations but i think ultimately brands have to get comfortable with being vulnerable and accept that they're not going to have all the answers right now and that's okay not to have those answers. I don't expect them to have the answers, but what I do expect is for them to find the best possible solutions to the problems they're facing. And that does mean putting their necks on the line and speaking to activists and people that sit on the other side of the problem to help them reach those solutions. Yeah. It's not yeah. an option. It's not an option really to not work together, is it, Lizzie? I don't think so. And I think it, it works best for everyone all round. If it's if it's coming from a meaningful place and a brand mm. is going to you and saying, do you know what? We we have a problem to, of communicating X, Y and Z. We are really trying. We're not mm. perfect, but we have put this in place. This is this is where we want to get to. This is the goal that we have. This is how we're going to get there. Can you help us? Of course, mm. why would I not want to help a brand achieve that end goal? <laughs> when it suits my objective just because they're not perfect at the moment they approach me yeah yeah and do you think um with gen z kind of maturing as well do you think that we'll really see that pressure from them as a generation um on more transparency more commitment from brands and working with people like you to help communicate that back to gen z as a consumer group I mean, when it comes to like Gen Z, in fact, even millennials to a degree as well, the mm. expect it should be the expectation that brands are going to be questioned and called out, not crisis mm -hmm. comms. It, yeah. The whole mindset around it needs to shift. This is just the norm trend, now. Right? Yeah. Say that again. Sorry, um, it, it needs to be addressed up front. 100%. Yeah. Like, and this is where I think some brands are making that shift. They're sort of looking at their strategy and saying, okay, what, what are the problems here? How can we address these now? Rather than hoping that nobody notices and that they can just get away with them. Because Gen Z, like I say, even millennials, they, they question everything and they will continue to do so. They're very savvy now. Get, getting away with greenwashing is becoming increasingly difficult for brands. I think it is literally just a case of owning your story. And if you can't mm. own it, don't share it until you can. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, as we were just saying, as brands face more and more interrogation on their commitments and credentials from the public, do you think that uh, influencers can help communicate this to consumers so they come from a, a different kind of point of view? Influencers are influencers because they've built trust with their audiences and they're relatable and often they can take very complex issues that brands struggle to communicate and scientists struggle to communicate and break them down into something really simple and digestible. Mm -hmm. And I think that's yeah. where brands really benefit from, from partnering with the right influencer for their brand or their particular campaign because they're so much more relatable to audiences and mm. that's exactly what brands need it's all about authenticity right yeah yeah um so lizzie what's what's the end goal then for plastic patrol i mean is there an end goal is there ever an end and you know where where do you feel that you want to take it our sort of mission is to eradicate litter from nature and if we can achieve that in my lifetime, then that's Plastic Patrol's wow. job done. If we could literally walk down the street and litter didn't exist, I will feel that we've done a good job. Um, whether we'll get there or not, I'm not sure. Um, I'm optimistic and I think we are working on a lot of different uh, areas. So it's not just about our cleanups. We've talked already about the work we're doing with government and the, the work that we're doing with, with industry. So yeah. I suppose our 
our mission and our vision now is to continue working across these sort of three very important but very different areas and bridging the gaps to bring them closer together so that we can ultimately reach the end goal that we have in mind to make sure that litter no longer needs to exist and it's possible to do you know there's more and more talk about how we can adapt into creating a circular economy and the value that we can attain yeah. from waste that's generated. There's no reason mm. why we can't do these things. It, it takes time and it takes commitment from everybody at every level to achieve those. Absolutely. And I mean, aside from brand campaigns and partnerships, how can people get involved with you? How can people get involved with Plastic Patrol? What can they do? Oh, they can do lots of things. You can download the Plastic Patrol app and log litter anywhere in the world. It doesn't have to just be on our cleanups. You know, if you're walking the dog, going for a picnic in the park, anything that you find that's litter that can go in there, just upload it. Join one of our cleanups. Obviously, at the moment, because of uh, the pandemic, we're not able to run those for the general public in sort of real time, face to face. But we're taking it online and we've got a lot of um, sort of well-being professionals and uh, experts that are coming on and giving up their time on our channel doing takeovers to do sort of fitness exercises, breathwork exercises. And in return, the people watching that are asked to then go out and litter pick afterwards. Like that's their that's their payment, their, their nature tax. Um, changing habits at home, you know, just thinking about your own consumption in everyday life um, or making donations to Plastic Patrol to kind of help keep funding the work that we're doing. So there's lots of ways that people can be involved. OK, so please get in touch with us if you are interested in the topic we've been discussing today. Um, and if you'd like to partner with a person or people of influence um, that you feel could highlight important issues, messages, or perhaps, you know, be part of a campaign that you're creating. So thank you from all three of us.